Welcome, everybody. Welcome to this webinar, which is co-hosted by the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at Notre Dame University and the Peace Research Institute, uh, Oslo. This is the second joint webinar that we host after the 7th of October attacks by Hamas in Israel. The first webinar was held on the 2nd of November and addressed the imperative of a humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza. For those of you who missed it, a video is available on the web pages of both institutions. My name is Christian berg Hartwicken. I'm a research professor at PRIO and I lead the Institute's Middle East Center. I have the pleasure of moderating today's event. We all carry grief, shock, even disbelief at what's taken place before our eyes in Gaza, but also in the West Bank and beyond. We are shocked by the sheer scale and intensity of the violence, by the depth of suffering that it brings about, and by the difficulty of seeing what is next. In today's event, we want to focus on the regional dimensions of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict at this critical juncture. We ask, what are the main conflict lines, the military activities and the escalation risks at the regional level? We ask what have various states and multilateral actors in the region as well as beyond done to prevent regional escalation? What strategies are missing? And then and ultimately, is the time now ripe for a regional platform in which states of the region come together, both to prevent further escalation and potentially also to inform and support long-term political solutions? To address these questions, we have a very competent panel. We have with us Ibrahim Frayat, who is uh, an associate professor of conflict management and humanitarian action at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. We have uh, Banaf Shikinoush, who is an international geopolitical consultant and an independent scholar of international relations and Middle East studies, as well as uh, an academic author. We have uh, Asher Kaufman, who is the John M. Reagan Jr. Director of the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. And last but not least, we have Laurie Nathan, who is a professor of practice of the practice of mediation, also at the Kroc Institutes. So what we'll do now is that we'll have each of the four panelists speak for somewhere around eight minutes, and then we'll follow that by a panel discussion in which we will try to focus mainly on the regional me mechanisms and we will be trying difficult that it is at this particular time to be forward looking. We will discuss uh, both strengths and weaknesses of existing platforms and we will look at whether there is a need for new ones and if so, what those new ones should look like. So with no further ado, we will turn to the first speaker Ibrahim Frayat, who is with us from uh, Doha. Please, Ibrahim. All right, thank you, uh, Pio and the Croc Institute uh, for organizing this. Uh, it's very timely and uh, it's very uh, important that we all come together uh, to address and to talk about uh, the disasters and uh, <clears throat> that's taking place in, in Gaza at the moment and uh, hopefully we can generate some uh, uh, ideas uh, about uh, the way forward uh, after hopefully understanding uh, you know how we came to this moment and i was asked to talk about um, <clears throat> hamas or what led to uh, october <clears throat> to october 7th or what was hamas thinking uh, when october 7th happened uh, and here within, given the time, the limited time that I have, I will focus, I will mention three key factors that brought us to October 7th. Uh, when, uh, from a Hamas perspective, when is uh, the political stalemate that uh, was taking place uh, on, with regards to the Palestinian question, that actually started uh, in December 2016, with the last speech, in my view, that John Kerry delivered before he left his position as Secretary of State in um, in the United, in the U.S. administration, from that moment we got into a tunnel of uh, a political stalemate 
uh, in with regards to the Palestinian issue, where the Trump administration came to power, uh, that managed or tried to manage the issue uh, completely outside uh, the uh, Palestinian question, addressing the Arab-Israeli relations with what was called the deal of the century and uh, trying to make uh, Israel and Arab countries peace as without without the Palestinians, as Jason Greenplan, one of the architects of the deal of the century, was always saying that the Palestinians have no veto over Arab-Israeli peace, and uh, we do not have to wait for the Palestinians. So the Likud, uh, led by Netanyahu and the, the Israeli government and some Arab countries who got into this, uh, Abraham Accord, uh, again, bypassing the Palestinians uh, and the, the Israeli government was always saying that we told you so, we can make peace without the Palestinians, and this is the end of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, now, at the same time, uh, there was also the Arab Spring taking place, which was also where Arab populations were also busy with their own struggle against dictatorships in the region, and also was uh, the issue always stated that the, that Palestine is no longer a priority, not for the people who were fighting against their dictators, not all, not also for the uh, Arab governments who are making uh, peace with the, with Israel without necessarily solving the Palestinian question, as the Israeli government was always saying. So. We got into this political stalemate. Basically, there was no serious movements on this track after the John Kerry's speech back in 2016. What exacerbated the matter was the Biden administration, who instead of reversing or attempting to reverse the Trump administration's approach, he actually bought into it and he built into it. And this was... Uh, culminated actually by the most recent uh, attempt to by uh, the Biden administration to make peace between or normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel um, without again necessarily uh, delving into the Palestinian question and addressing uh, the uh, Palestinian question. And I was always asked that whether Hamas did this as a response to the regional uh, developments of the Biden administrations was trying to make normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia without the Palestinians. And actually, my answer to it, it's only a manifestation of the political stalemate that the whole Palestinian question was living. So it wasn't in response to this, but this was only one indicator, a manifestation of a much bigger issue, a much larger issue, which is the political stalemate that lasted for over seven, eight years without any, any hope or, or any solution or any, anything on the horizon. So that was only one indicator. And probably you could say, that it came as the straw that broke the camel's back. That uh, also that with seeing an approaching deal between Saudi Arabia, normalization and Israel, then that was the peak of, the, of this political stalemate that necessitated an action to overthrow the whole stalemate from, uh, uh, from the uh, Palestinian perspective or from Hamas perspective. Now, this is one reason. The second reason is uh, what I call also the structural violence against the Palestinians in Gaza, and at the same time, maintaining a prospering apartheid regime in, in the West Bank and Gaza. Now, in Gaza, since 2007, we had uh, uh, a very invasive blockade uh, that turned Gaza into basically a concentration camp, where after Hamas won the elections in a democratic process and Israel and the U.S. administration refused to engage with Hamas during that time, then 
and a blockade, a very strict blockade was imposed in Gaza, no free movement of goods or services or the people, uh, while at the same time, uh, uh, progress so containing Hamas in Gaza and the and the Gaza and the Palestinians in the Gaza, while at the same time building and maintaining and prospering an apartheid regime in the West Bank, also by expansions of settlements and building two systems, uh, two legal systems again in the West Bank and Gaza. So what this did actually, the structural violence against the Palestinians in Gaza in particular, that the statement was we withdrew from Gaza, we left it for the Palestinians. Instead of Gaza becoming Singapore, they turned into violence and terrorism and all of this rhetoric uh, from the Israeli government. But in reality, Gaza was under siege since 2007. And this look, this structural violence in Gaza actually caused a governance crisis for Hamas. So Hamas was also, as a result of the winning of the election, was given the task of delivering in terms of governance for the people in Gaza while again suffering the uh, the blockade, the strict blockade in Gaza without being able to govern. So this issue, uh, and, the, and, and we saw indicators actually lately uh, before October 7th, the last few years, where we saw many of the Palestinians in Gaza were trying to cross the Mediterranean to Europe and some of them dying in the sea because of the crisis, the governance crisis in Gaza. No jobs, highest employment in the region, probably one of the highest in the world, especially among youth, with no prospects, with no ability to, uh, you know, to move or to change the status quo. This was, in the Netanyahu government's view, was... Uh, uh, and a successful or uh, a working formula where uh, he contained Hamas in Gaza through the blockade and maintaining a division between the Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank. So containing Hamas threat and building or expanding in settlements in the West Bank, keeping the Palestinians divided, so this was a working formula for, for, for Netanyahu, which seemed to be not working. It blew up in his face at the end of the day. The third, and also I'm careful of time, that I have to mention that this is, in my view, was a key factor in, uh, that led us to uh, October 7th. It was about the Palestinian prisoners. Before October 7th, there were 5,000 200 Palestinian prisoners in different Israeli prisons, including 170 children, 33 women, and 1,260 under what's called administrative, administrative detention, where you're basically put in a prison, no charges, no lawyer, no court. You don't know what you're imprisoned about. And this could last the first uh, the first time for six months could be re uh, renewed indefinitely. So, and you continue being in prison without any charges, without any legal system. So the prisoners issue, there were many prisoners who have been in Israeli prison for 20 years, 30 years, and so forth. So this was always a key issue for the entire Palestinian society, not only for Hamas, but this is very important. This is a very emotional issue for the entire Palestinian society and, and by the way, to Abbas himself, where he was asked and penalized by the government, by the Israeli government, not to deal with the families of the prisoners. But Abbas made many concessions on many issues, but he always maintained that the Palestinian prisoners in Israeli prisons are always a priority. And Israel deducted the taxes from the taxes that it transfers to the Palestinian Authority, what the Palestinian Authority pays for the families of them. But the, even Abbas from the, from the forum or the platform of the United Nations 
He made it so clear that no concessions on the Palestinian prisoners serving in Israeli prisons. So that was given also past experiences, Hamas realized the only way is to address the prisoners' issues is through kidnapping and exchange of prisoners, which was, I think, uh, the way they saw it, it was a due issue that they had to address it and contributed to the, uh, to the uh, eruption or outbreak of violence on October 7th. So I'll stop here and we can always talk about uh, other issues in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. Very, very interesting. And I think we'll take um, particular note on your or your analysis of uh, of uh, what drove Hamas in regional terms, uh, where you say that it wasn't really an attempt to undermine the Israeli Arab rapprochement. It was rather uh, uh, a direct implication of the stalemate in uh, in the Israeli Palestinian conflict and the sidelining of the Palestinian Palestinian issue as it were. I'm sure that's something we will uh, we will return to later. Now we move to the next speaker, which is uh, Banafshik Inush. You speak to us from the U.S. Uh, West Coast, where it's still perhaps not early morning, but uh, certainly not dark night as it is in Oslo. Good to have you with us. Well, thank you. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. And um, what uh, I want to thank the Kroc Institute and Prio, of course, for inviting me and uh, having taken stock of the remarks made by our first speaker, I want to transport the uh, conversation into the uh, larger regional context and add an, introduc an introductory note to say that obviously the Palestinian crisis, the Israeli Hamas war is a very complicated issue. And I will only be able to touch about on one aspect of this regional uh, crisis, which pertains to Iran and which I've been asked to discuss. Um, as far as the Iranian perspective is concerned, there was a deliberate regional uh, plan to contain Iran. And at the center of this plan was Israel. Um, not only through the Abraham Accords, but also increased Israeli um, policy navigation around Iran's other borders, including in northern Iraq and in Azerbaijan and along Iran's northern corridors into Central Asia. The sense of containment obviously added to Iran's sense of regional isolation, and therefore coming into this um, latest Israel-Hamas war, Iran has viewed it as um, as something that is breaking this, this potential uh, real serious containment. And to the extent that it's breaking that containment and weakening Israel, Iran's leaders have been forthcoming about offering support for the actions of Hamas in the process of this latest conflict. However, they've also distanced themselves, as we know, from direct involvement or engagement as, as, as an interested party in this conflict, very mindful of the need to keep Israel uh, at arm's length. So with that uh, introduction, I'd like to delve into the questions that I've been asked by Quark Institute and Prio to address, for example, what are the main conflict lines, military activities, and escalation risks at the regional level? Uh, there's a multiplicity of actors when we speak about Iran and its allies in the region. And here we're just talking about a few of them, like Hezbollah, Hamas itself, the Islamic Jihad and its Al-Quds military wing, the Kataiba Hezbollah in Iraq, the Zadina al-Assam Brigade, which is Hamas's military wing, not to mention Houthis and Syria. So there are multiple flanks or fronts. Uh, in this conflict, Lebanon, which Iran's media is now referring to as the Islamic resistance of the north facing Israel from the north, uh, is one flank. Yemen is the southern front. Iraq is the eastern flank or front in confronting or at least breaking um, the sense of containment that Iran has felt coming from Israel. So um, we're talking about several regional flanks, the main one, of course, being Gaza. And all these flanks are operating primarily in order to prevent population movements to the south of Gaza and the eventual exodus of the Palestinians, which, with, which Iran and its allies are very much against, the potential of that happening. What's interesting about this multiple front confrontation with Israel in the process of this uh, uh, conflict 
is the extraterritoriality of these multiple flan flanks and fronts. Um, they're operating across defined geographic borders at four country levels. And here we're talking about the axis of resistance that Iran operates on this extraterritorial level. What this means is that there is a strategy to build up multiple axes of resistance fronts to confront in Israel now and in the longer haul. Also keeping Israel at arm's length through these multiple flanks um, to, to not be able to reach Iran directly. This also indicates the potential escalation of a hybrid warfare by the resistance axis, which is already underway, not only through cyber attacks, the mining as Iranian media is reporting of Gaza by Hamas, etc. But the real escalation, in my view, will result, um, uh, well, not in my view, actually, what Iran is saying is that the real escalation will result if this war does not end now. And this means that Basically, Iran is fearful that the aggravation of this war will eventually bring Israel closer to, to pondering a, a direct attack on Iran. So the, 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 the axis of resistance is operating to end the war while also keeping a level of tension with Israel going on for as long as possible in order to weaken Israel. Now, what have various states and multilateral actors in the region done to prevent this escalation? Uh, in my view, again, these multiple flanks will carry a huge risk of escalation, no doubt, but um, the multi-flank strategy also aims to show, show the risk of escalation to Israel, to encourage the peace. But peace for what purpose, besides the obvious need to end the humanitarian crisis resulting from this war? Peace to help the non-Abraham Accords member states emerge as stronger diplomatic actors as far as Iran is concerned. And here we're talking about countries like Iran, Turkey, and Qatar versus countries like the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain who decided to join the Abraham Accords or Saudi Arabia, which said that it would like to move forward with its relations with Israel before the outbreak of the October 7 war. Now, there's a general pattern of offense and retreat obviously happening in this process of building peace through war, and there's been multiple tensions in Syria and Iraq, as we know, in Yemen, there have been attacks on U.S. targets in the region, as well as on Israeli targets by Iran's allies. Now, um, I want to move forward very quickly, mindful that I've delayed this meeting being late into it, but... Um, we, we were asked to talk about strategy. And the strategy missing, in my view, is how to define the so-called future of the region uh, through Iran's involvement in this conflict or direct involvement in its conflict with, through its allies. Um, there's a lack of strong diplomatic voice by Iran's allies operating in this conflict. So in the absence of diplomacy by these paradiplomatic actors, it's not clear to me what the future of the region will look like after this conflict. Who will define the region's future? And will it be in terms of a post-Abraham Accords future or pre-Abraham Accords future? Who will define the future US role? Who will define the future of Hamas? And where will Israel stand in this future region? Now, is it time ripe for a regional platform in which states of the region will come together to prevent an escalation and to be inform and support political solutions? I think that by most indications, it could be with sufficient resolve. And here is why. There are already actions being undertaken by Iranian allies, um, not just to spread the war, but also uh, to contain it. Um, Iran, Oman, and Qatar have been talking, as well as with Egypt, to find a solution to end not only the humanitarian crisis, but also the war itself. The Saudi and Iranian leaders and their defense ministers have been uh, engaging and talking not only about how to end the crisis, but also about collaborating on the defense front, which points that even countries like Saudi Arabia are fully aware that the continuation of the war will come at a cost not only to Iran, to Israel, but also to the countries that were previously inclined uh, to the idea of working with Israel. Now, the axis of resistance that Iran operates continues to say that it's ready for all scenarios if this war continues to escalate. 
Um, what this axis wants is that the Palestinians remain in Gaza fully. Um, uh, and what they also want is that Israel is, uh, is not able to turn Gaza into a buffer zone for itself. So uh, any ceasefire that they're calling for currently is to prevent and reverse the exodus of Palestinians. Uh, Iran says that this ceasefire should be permanent. And in the meantime, um, I think that Iran will emerge with a stronger voice at the table about the future of the region and the distribution of power short of a Israeli, direct Israeli violent confrontation. And that itself will carry on, uh, offer multiple new scenarios, strategic geopolitical scenarios for us to discuss and analyze. I hope I was kind of clear enough, but I tried to cover a lot in a short period of time. So thank you. Thank you, Banafshe. You did that uh, very well, very, very interesting. And uh, again, not the uh, mainstream analysis that you that you read, I think, uh, insightful, and I'm sure will also stimulate debate. So we turn now to um, to Usher Kaufman at uh, the Kroc Institute. Usher. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. And thank you for uh, the speakers. Uh, who preceded me for their insightful uh, comments. I'm going to share with you two observations uh, related to Israel, uh, to the, the regional dimension from Israeli perspective. One is uh, Israel's security doctrine and uh, its regional implications. And the other is the Arab Peace in Initiative from 2002, that since October 7th uh, has been revived in some Arab uh, forums. <clears throat> I'll start with the Israeli security doctrine. So in my view, in order to understand Israel's actions in Gaza, as well as its regional strategy, we need to go back to its uh, security doctrine that has been dictating its military and political behavior in the Middle East since uh, the early 1950s, and in fact, has not changed uh, significantly uh, since. Israel's uh, security doctrine assumes that there is a fundamental asymmetry uh, between the state of Israel and the Arab and Muslim world around it. And I'm, I repeat, this is Israel's perception. And Israel needs to bring its enemies to the conclusion that there is no practical way to bring about the destruction of Israel and to come to terms with its uh, existence uh, in the end. From an Israeli standpoint, the peace agreements with Egypt and Jordan and the Abraham Accords with the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco and Sudan were an outcome of this uh, security doctrine. The possibility of normalization with Saudi Arabia was also perceived as a product of the Israeli security doctrine and not as an opportunity to reconsider this, uh, uh, this doctrine. So to put it uh, more directly, these peace agreements were enabled, facilitated by the security do uh, uh, doctrine. Without this doctrine, Israel would not have secured these peace agreements. Uh, as we all know, uh, all these peace agreements also served as a way for Israel to circumvent the epicenter of the conflict, which is in fact the, the fundamental of this conflict, the struggle between we, the Palestinians, over the same piece of the land. Ignoring the Palestinians reached its peak with the Abraham Accord, Accords, as we have already heard from Ibrahim, uh, that do not mention Pal Palestine or Palestinians even once unlike the peace agreements with Jordan and Egypt that at least pay lip service to uh, Palestinians. The Abraham Accords, to remind us, were made possible through American diplomatic effort and uh, convergence of security interests between the Gulf states and Israel vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Iran. This convergence of security interests uh, still hold, and I will return to this point uh, at the end of my presentation. Historically, Israel's security doctrine relied on three elements, deterrence, early warning, and if needed, decisive and swift uh, victory. In 2011, defense of civilian population was added to this security doctrine as a result of new security self challenges such as uh, terrorism against Israeli civilians and ballistic and mi missile threats from Iran, Hezbollah, and uh, Hamas. I'm obviously simplifying this uh, security doctrine for the sake because of lack of uh, time, but I think my description is sufficient to describe its uh, essence. This security doctrine collapsed on October 7th, 
in all of its four uh, components. There was no deterrence, uh, no early warning. Well, there was early warning, but it was not paid attention to by uh, the upper echelons of the military and the uh, uh, politicians. And currently, there is no decisive and swift victory in uh, Gaza. And despite this absolute uh, failure of the doctrine, Israel is now operating so aggressively based on the same premises of this same uh, uh, doctrine. And while the stated goal of this war is to eradicate Hamas both militarily and politically, the broader objectives of Israel are to restore deterrence uh, regionally, given the continued belief that its existence in the Middle East relies not on reconciliation with the Palestinians and other regional states, but on its military might. Diplomacy and regional alliances are important, but they are secondary to the projection of military strength uh, in Israel's uh, logic. As Minister of Defense, Yoav Gallant said at the outset of this war, we need to deter our uh, enemies for the next 50 years. These enemies, from an Israeli standpoint, are the members of the so-called uh, axis of resistance, headed by Iran and its regional uh, allies, and most importantly, uh, Hezbollah. So the destruction that Israel is now carrying out in Gaza constitutes, uh, in my view, intentionally, a direct message of Hezbollah that Lebanon would experience a similar level of violence should Hezbollah opt for starting a war with Israel. It is also intended to create shock and awe among Palestinians in the West Bank, as, it as this current government, Israeli government, has not reduced its intention to continue with the creeping annexation of the West Bank. Uh, additionally, there are voices now within uh, security circles in Israel, including Minister of uh, Defense, uh, Gallant himself, that argue that Israel should use this opportunity and also confront uh, Hezbollah once and for all, given the existential threat that the organization is perceived to be posing to, uh, to Israel. So far, this has not been translated into launching a full war against Hezbollah, perhaps as a result of American pressure on Israel not to do so. But the risk is imminent and uh, real. If a war between Hezbollah and Israel erupts, we might see levels of violence, mayhem, and destruction, both in Lebanon and in Israel, that may not be that different, and perhaps even more, than what we have been seeing in uh, the Gaza Strip. My presentation so far has been bleak, but I would like to mention one possible constructive regional scenario connected to the Arab Initiative from uh, 2002. Arab Peace Initiative. As a reminder, on March 28, 2002, in a meeting of uh, the Arab League in Beirut, Arab states voted unanimously on what became known as the Arab Peace Initiative, offering full normalization with Israel of all Arab states in exchange for Israel withdrawal from all territories it occupied in the 1967 war and the establishment of a Palestinian state in the West Bank, Gaza Strip, including East Jerusalem. In 2002, both Israel and Hamas opposed the Arab Initiative. From February through April 2002, Hamas ramped up its suicide attacks inside Israel, making these months the deadliest time period for Israeli civilians, in fact, until October 7, uh, 2000, I mean 2023. Hamas suicide attacks then were intended to guarantee the failure of the Arab Initiative. Israeli government at the time ignored completely the initiative, and launched Operation Defensive Shield that eventually crushed the Palestinian Second uh, Intifada. So since October 7th, the Arab Peace Initiative has uh, returned to public discussion, not in Israel, but in Arab forums, putting it again on the table as a path for ending the war in Gaza and the resumption of diplomatic efforts to reach a negotiated agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. Right now, this initiative has no political viability, as neither Israel nor the Palestinians are ready for any negotiated agreement on any kind, any part. Um, so they are, in fact, farther from the possibility than there were for, for any negotiations of any agreement than there were on October 6th. And I'm not suggesting that uh, on October 6th it was remotely viable. But when we think about uh, the day after the war, we must consider what seems to be the only viable option for a constructive transformation of this uh, conflict. 
The diplomatic infrastructure is already there through the peace agreements that Israel has signed with some of its Arab neighbors. These agreements have also shown their resiliency, as so far they have not been seriously challenged despite the mounting pressure from the streets against the Arab regimes to disconnect diplomatic ties with Israel. Uh, all these uh, Arab states also share an interest with Israel to remove Hamas from the political equation of any future uh, arrangement. And they also share uh, similar uh, ideas, thoughts about with regards to Iran's uh, regional uh, ambitions. What is required for Israel is also its transformation of its security doctrine that on October 7th failed completely. At the heart of a new security doctrine, there has to be an, uh, a realization that the most critical existential threat for Israel is to allow the conflict with the Palestinians to fester. That the only way to address the conflict is not by managing it, but rather by think, uh, thinking constructively about a political formula that would allow both Israeli Jews and Palestinians to exercise their national aspirations with dignity over the same piece of uh, land. It is hard to think of uh, the U.S. as an honest broker of a future political process, but it is still the U.S., in my view, that holds the keys for this uh, possibility. And we perhaps could talk about that in our conversation after this uh, presentation. Thank you. Sorry. Then we are not You're hearing. muted. I'm going back to mute once I start to talk. Here we are. Now it seems stable. Uh, thank you, Asher. Uh, very, very useful introduction uh, to uh, where Israel stands in this and to the continuity of a security doctrine that in your words, collapsed on the 7th of October, but still keeps informing uh, the Israeli reaction as we as we speak. I'm sure we will return to that, and not the least to your last point about uh, the potential role of uh, external actors and the United States in this in uh, particular. But before we dive into the panel discussion, we'll have uh, Laurie Nathan also with us from uh, Notre Dame. Please, Laurie. Right. Thank you, Christian. Thank you very much to the panelists for their rich insights and observations. The problem that I, that I want to address and offer a solution to is the problem of escalation of violence at the regional level. Um, as panelists have said, this risk rises as the destruction of Gaza and the killing of civilians continues and increases. In a volatile situation such as this, there is also the risk of escalation arising from accidental moves or moves, military moves from Iran, or from proxies or from any other actor that are intended to stir the pot rather than evoke a full scale war, but that get out of hand. Escalation, we know from many other regions, has its own dynamics. It has a kind of life of its own. So I want to make a proposal with respect to the problem of regional risk and the proposal, in essence, is the establishment of a regional forum for conflict management and resolution. The regional forum for conflict management and resolution would comprise Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, Qatar, and other key Arab states. I'm going to make proposals with respect to the objectives of this forum, its orientation, its strategies, its composition, and its structure. And I have to say by way of caveat, uh, two caveats. The first is I'm approaching this from a mediator's perspective, which is to say, if we can't, from a peacemaking or mediator's perspective, make a situation better, can we at least stop it from getting worse? So that's, that's often a, a deep concern from a mediator's perspective. And the second, second caveat is that my proposal is based on extensive comparative research on regional arrangements for conflict prevention, conflict management, and conflict resolution, but I'm not an expert on the Middle East. And so I'm going to turn to our panelists when I'm done to 
uh, fine tune to correct, to rebut, uh, and to, to compensate for my relative ignorance here. So this regional forum for conflict management re and resolution would have three objectives that are based on different phases of the conflict. In the short to medium term, while the fighting continues in Gaza, the objective of the forum would be to prevent the escalation of violence at the regional level. In the medium to long term, when fighting in Gaza ends, the objective would be to contribute to the stabilization, governance and reconstruction of Gaza. The medium to long term objective would be to work for the resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict through a negotiated settlement. And relevant in this regard is the Arab Peace, Peace Initiative. I was going to offer a summary, but Asha has already done that. And I share the view that this is really the only constructive, um, potentially viable option for conflict resolution in the long term. In the light of these objectives, the orientation of the forum in the short to medium term would be what the UN refers to as operational prevention. Operational prevention of conflict seeks to prevent disputes from becoming violent, and if violence breaks out, to prevent escalation and reestablish stability. Operational prevention of conflict in UN discourse does not seek to resolve the conflict. So the orientation short to medium term is operational conflict prevention. The orientation of the forum in the long term or medium to long term is structural prevention of conflict to use UN terms. And structural conflict prevention would seek to address the structural, systemic and political causes of violent conflict. The main strategies of the regional forum would be preventive diplomacy, which is a form of mediation that is focused more on prevention than resolution and facilitation of dialogue among actual and potential conflict parties. In terms of its structure, the forum would have an ambassadorial committee that is permanently in session. So this is quite different from the ad hoc meetings, conferences, et cetera, that are being convened. It would be a standing forum at ambassadorial level and would then also have uh, ministerial and heads of state levels of engagement. Um, this morning, there was a very interesting think piece by Lena Katib uh, published on the website of the journal Foreign Affairs that is relevant to what we're talking about now. She headed her piece, The Case for Arab Leadership on Gaza, How Regional Countries Can Pool Their Leverage to End the Israel-Hamas War. And she argues that what she calls the Big Five Arab powers, Egypt, Jordan, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and UAE, should coordinate their efforts on Gaza and on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in order to achieve greater coordination and enhance their leverage. And the proposal that I'm putting has the same logic. The logic here is that a regional forum for conflict management and resolution would recognize the imperative of a regional response, a coordinated regional response. It would obviously not be the only track. It would have to be supported by a global approach it would be preferable to the current bilateral and ad hoc diplomatic processes. If it works, it would present publicly a unified voice, a set of common principles and a common long-term vision, notwithstanding the differences amongst, amongst its member states. And it would work discreetly at a diplomatic level to contain, and eventually we hope to help resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Back to you, Christian. Thank you, uh, Laurie. That's something to uh, that's something to examine in further detail. I know you haven't all been presented with this plan in all its finer nuances in advance, but uh, I think it's um, just strikes the right balance between being detailed and being uh, open and rough that you can still both challenge it and develop it in your comments. And of course, I'm not meaning to restrict you to discuss only the finer details of, of uh, Laurie's um, sketch of a plan here, but I, I would really welcome some discussion as to whether you think this is a way to go or even 
the way to go and whether it bears any premise or whether this is something that is, uh, in fact, due to reasons you may elaborate on, uh, a bo an idea that is still born. So uh, who wants to start out? A hand, anybody? I'll let Asher first. I think Asher had his hand up first. Oh, okay. You are, oh, you have uh, better eyes than Asher. When Asher can start, I can follow. So um, I'm, I'm speaking here as a geopolitical analyst from the 1990s, 1991 onwards, also in Madrid, etc. There have been multiple proposals on the table to have, to come up with the idea of a peace, well, Arab-centered focus, uh, leaving out Iran, uh, leaving out Iran's allies. Uh, each time Israel has engaged in pushing Iranian allies out of you know segments of the region that are an immediate threat to Israel, what has happened is that the Iranians have penetrated those areas and built alliances, forged alliances, and in this latest conflict. What, what Israel has delivered to Iran is enormous in the sense that until this conflict uh, happened, Iran was still struggling um, to align fully the Islamic Jihad, which is fully backed by Iran with Hamas interests at all times. But now uh, if Hamas is to depend on Iran for existential reasons, uh, although it has a lot of uh, issues with Iran, uh, and if it is shunned by the Arab world, um, especially by big, big leaders in the Arab world, like Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia was trying to shun Hamas in the past two years, um, because of, partly because of the Abraham Accords. Um, then, um, then basically we're giving Iran a bigger voice here in the long haul, because it's very hard for Israel in any imaginable deterrence doctrine to be able to fully deter uh, sub-state, non-state actors. You know, the extraterritoriality of the flanks that face Israel are enormous. Um, so um, the other th uh, thing that I want to add is that the GCC itself uh, suffers not only from divisions of the Gulf Arab states, but also um, from a general sense, in my humble view, of being more a reactionary force rather than a proactive force. So what, uh, I really like the proposal of a regional forum, but I think we, there should also be a discussion about how this regional forum can be truly proactive. If we go back to, um, especially by its Arab actors, because if we take the example of the 2006 Hezbollah-Israel war, a lot of what happened then is happening now, meaning that the GCC countries, the Arab world, were forced into a reactionary position. And in the end, they turned to Iran to do something about it. And it was Qatar that then stepped in and worked with Iran and, and got Hezbollah to kind of come up with a modus operandi to kind of create a temporary or whatever it was that they did along the borders. Same situation. So the Arab world, and especially the GCC countries, uh, Egypt is not in a very good position. It closed the uh, Rafa, you know, crossing, and then it opened it. You know, all of this creates a certain um, sense of, 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 of me as an observer viewing the Arabs as not being necessarily as proactive as countries as, as Iran. And, and look at, I mean, look at the Houthis. They're firing at the United States and at Israel. Who would have thought that would happen? Uh, and they're getting away with it to an extent because the United States doesn't want to escalate Yemen any further. Saudi Arabia doesn't want to escalate the situation there. So this issue of proactiveness and reactiveness of multiple actors has to be assessed within any regional construct for a future for a future peace. Otherwise, Iran and its allies will come out again and come out with more vengeance. Thank you, Vanafsha. That's one very clear challenge. Uh, if I read you correctly, any setup that doesn't thoroughly include Iran and yield influence to it is uh, unlikely to uh, to uh, to be able to contribute to prevent escalation and certainly unable to contribute to in the long term solve the problem yeah I'm sure we'll return to that Ashur you're next yeah um, I mean in principle I like uh, Laurie's proposal 
concerning a regional forum because I think uh, regional forums, if you look, uh, you know, the way the the conflict in Ireland was uh, was is resolved or addressed, it was uh, through the support of the EU. And I think you can look at the other cases in Africa where the African uh, Union served as a forum to try and mitigate or at least to resolve uh, immediate cases, uh, short-term uh, solutions to uh, to conflicts. So, in principle, the idea of a regional forum is the way I would strongly support the idea that this is the way uh, to go. Uh, the challenge is that, and here I'm adding to uh, what Ban Fashev was uh, saying, is that the, the region has a history of the divisions that go back to the creation of uh, you know, the modern geopolitical map of uh, the Middle East, the start of the nation states in the Middle East from the 1940s, the 50s onwards. You know, the, from the 50s onwards, the, the Arab world was known to be divided according to the lines of what uh, Malcolm Carroll was called uh, the Arab Cold War, uh, divisions between states, within states. Uh, we are no longer in a state of a Cold War between Arab states, but we still have uh, strong divisions among uh, uh, Arab states over other uh, economic, political uh, lines. The JCC, uh, as was already suggested, is not a strong forum, and it actually demonstrates that within the greater Arab world, there are regional divisions of countries that first con are concerned about their own uh, uh, sub-regional uh, uh, interests. And of course, on top of it all, you have the so-called division between uh, the Arab world and, uh, and Iran, and without addressing that, any regional forum would be, uh, would be challenged by uh, spoilers that might try to sabotage an, an effort to reach this regional uh, forum. However, we are in a state of conflict, uh, unprecedented uh, regional conflict. This has no parallel to anything we experienced in, uh, in the Middle East since 1948, I would argue, uh, perhaps 1967, but I'm not sure even that. Uh, and this could be used as a leverage for rethinking uh, a regional uh, uh, regional partnerships over over addressing the uh, this uh, uh, this crisis. Uh, I am not sure how to go that uh, route, but there is no question that uh, we are experiencing now something that really has no has no parallel in my in my uh, mind. And the risks of escalation, further escalations are real, and the risk of continued uh, festering of the situation are uh, real. Uh, so it could be an opportunity for rethinking uh, regional alliances and regional partnerships. Thank you very much, Asher. That, Asher, that's very, that's very helpful as well. Uh, Ibrahim. Uh, thank you, Christian, and thank you, Lawrence, for the proposal. Actually, I'll make two uh, comments, one um, on the Israeli security doctrine and one on the proposal. Uh, the Israeli security doctrine is, uh, as explained uh, by Asher, which, uh, I mean, to a certain uh, level, I mean, there was a good explanation of how this functions. However, I am uh, worried, actually, that uh, we're, uh, we're chasing an elusive objective here. Uh, what is Israeli security? I mean, the Arab Peace Initiative that Asher mentioned actually fully addressed the Israeli security in 2002, uh, where formally 20, 57 countries, Arab and Muslim country, majority countries, offered full normalization and full acceptance of Israel. Uh, but until today, from 2002, there is no Israeli response to the Arab Peace Initiative. So this fundamentally addresses the Israeli concern, but Israel chose not to. Uh, what is on the ground, however, happening is that this security of Israel, the elusive objective, the way we see it, that uh, actually is only used as a cover in order to expand, you know, for the expansion of the uh, Israeli settler colonial, colonial projects in, in, in the West Bank and Gaza. 
1993, there were 113,000 settlers in the West Bank. Today, there are 700,000 that killed the two state solutions. The observers of the Middle East conflicts everywhere, they tell you that the two state solutions became a joke. There is no such thing because settlements, the expansion of the Israeli settler colonial project in the West Bank just basically killed the two state solution. While we are chasing, you know, this objective of Israel's security. Israel's security, Israel has nuclear weapons. What more can you do for Israel to make it feel secure? The most advanced American technology, military technology, Israel has it. But still, you know, we're saying that Israel is still making the argument, you know, Israel's security. The only security can Israel can get is a through acceptance by by the enemy, by the different parties, which was offered again in 2002. And let me also actually raise an, an issue here on the, even on Hamas issue. Hamas engaged in 2006 in a fully democratic, internationally sponsored elections, democratic process in, in the Palestinian territories and won the elections. But then Israel and the U.S. administration refused to engage with Hamas in 2006 in the democratic process. Furthermore, in 2017, Hamas officially, officially amended its charter to accept a state on the 1967 borders uh, in 2017, officially. So, but again, this led all led to the frustration and the political stalemate that the Palestinians suffered from since again 2016. And this came October 7 now that recentered the Palestinian issue, not only as a priority in the, on the regional level, but on the international level. So unfortunately, we are witnessing a process here, unless you engage in violence, everyone will forget you and this is this is very dangerous the way we manage and deal with conflicts it's only through violence that you can be seen and you can be noticed and this is the process that the u.s administration and the israeli government has nurtured and built in you know over the past years now this takes me actually is to the uh, to the proposal uh, to Laura's proposal which is about you know, conflict management, and and I and and I think it's there are good things to build on. However, I did not hear that the Palestinians are part of this. What happened to our inclusive conflict resolution? That's one. Two. Uh, I agree in in theory and in the literature. We always talk about the short run and the medium, long term things, which which makes sense. However. It's extremely important to understand about the Palestinians that they reached a very unbearable situation, level of, uh, uh, of suppression and repression and apartheid that it's unbearable, not only in, the, not only in Gaza, after you know, seeing people throwing them in the Mediterranean to cross to Europe and to get, to get out of the concentration camp there. It's also in the West Bank. In the West Bank today, as a result of the expansions of the settlements, you can't move like from one uh, city to another after a certain time, after 6 p.m., for example, because it's dangerous that you will be attacked by settlers, which now we are seeing settler violence, settler terrorism in the West Bank, the highest ever, right? And even the U.S. administration calling to, uh, you know, to... Uh, uh, to uh, uh, stop the settler violence, but but it's it's been it's becoming systematic. So the 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 violence and the uh, the segregation system, the apartheid system that the Palestinians are living cannot tolerate. You know, a short term and a management, and then there has to be addressed and 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 something that has the suffering of the palestinians the injustices of the palestinians must be addressed immediately and let me here actually go back to october 7 and cite this issue that everyone in the world talked about the music the music festival right that was attacked but no one mentioned about just a few kilometers 
from the music festivals there were people that been starving for for since 2007 and throwing themselves in the sea in order to cross to Europe so you have these two communities one is living a music festival and just three or two three miles away from it people with unemployment of over 60 percent and unable to put food for their people on the table this must be addressed in order to give credibility for any proposal for any management right of rather we need to address the suffering the injustices because now when this war is over what will happen israelis will go back to their normal life in their jobs and their factories and their universities and their musics and their other but then the Palestinians will go back to now what's estimated to be 60% of Gaza is more of a rubble, right, over that. And the in the West Bank are going back to experience to be subjected to settler terrorism that's now sponsored by the state of Israel itself. And one last point, and I will end here, and I'm sorry if I'm taking more of my th much more time, is that there hasn't been like a decisive factor in the past couple of years that contributed to this large scale outbreak of violence more than bringing officials government officials ministers to the israeli government who are openly smorich before before october 7 calling to wipe out the city of hawara calling for a genocide in Hawara, in the, the town near Nablus, officially, who's a government official, but nothing happened, right? Nothing, no, no U.S. response, no addressing of government officials calling openly for a genocide against the city of Hawara in near Nablus. And being a fear, right, of all the measures that are taking, building the settlements is the highest ever now of the settlements project. So again, I won't, I can continue to talk for hours, but Lauren, we need something, any proposal that needs to address this suffering, that to give the people on the ground that there is something changing. Otherwise, I'm so worried that who the people, the children that we are seeing today on TV, we 10 or 20 years later, we're going to see much worse than what we're seeing today. Because let's remember, in 2000, there was a second violent intifada, right? That we saw much, you know, many similar scenes of what we're seeing on TV today. But today is on a much larger scale. Those are the children who were born after 2000, after the second intifada. So we don't want to be kept in this cycle of violence. And we need to address something immediate that addresses the injustices, the suffering, so we can talk about long-term and acceptance and inclusivity. And sorry if I took longer than what I should. Laurie, would you like to respond or? Yeah, great. Um, thank you very much for the, the responses and the additional comments and insights. I have three comments in response. The first is that there are many regional state-based forums throughout the world that have conflict prevention management and resolution as part of their mandate. And they include the African Union, uh, which Asha referred to, um, the European Union, the OECE, the um, uh, Organization of American States, ASEAN, et cetera. And they, as we all know, have varying degrees of effectiveness. Some are relatively effective, at conflict prevention and or management and or resolution. Others, including Arab League and GCC are much less effective. It's clear from comparative research that these organizations are most effective when they have common norms. They are least effective when they have divergent norms, which is to say different values and political cultures. But that said, there are many examples of divergent norms, but common interests being sufficient for a single-minded strategy to address a particular problem. So even where states do not agree on a range of issues, if they have common interests in preventing or managing a particular conflict,
that provides then the basis for a political platform. Second, I, I take Ibrahim's point completely about this distinction between short, medium, and long term, and that one can't expect people who are suffering, who have a deep experience of injustice and oppression, one can't say to them, we'll just hang on for the long term because we're worrying about the short term. And so in any conflict management forum, there needs to be clarity on how the short, medium, and long term are connected to each other. And the long term can be present now. The long term doesn't have to just wait for the long term. In other words, if we view the long term as a final negotiated settlement for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, that can be put on the table now. And I think that's exactly where the Arab Peace Initiative is so relevant. It's already there. It's on the table. It's being resurrected, revived. So in this regional proposal that, I, that I'm putting forward, we're not saying the end goal, we'll let's just hold our breath and be patient. It's saying, here's the end goal. We want to put it on the agenda now. That is what we're working towards. I also take Ibrahim's point that to the extent that a forum like this can address ongoing suffering on the West Bank and Gaza, well, then of course that can be part of, or should be part of its mandate. My last comment, and I welcome your response if you think this is unreasonable, is that this forum is a forum of states, so would not include no, let me put it differently. It's a forum of states that seeks to engage with the major conflict actors that would include Hamas, would include the Israeli government, would include Iran, if necessary, would include Hezbollah. They are engaging with these actors as a third party mediator. Um, so this is taking the role that Qatar is playing, has been playing with respect to the ceasefire, or at least the truce, in Gaza and making that third party broker a regional actor, regional forum that is, has a regional wide perspective. So this forum, if it took shape, would be in constant dialogue and engagement with all the key actual or potential belligerent parties. So no one's being excluded. And it provides them with a way of talking to each other where they need to talk to each other and are currently not talking to each other. Uh, back to you, Christian. Thank you, Lori. Any reactions to that? I can make a few comments uh, yes, in response to Ibrahim's, uh, you know, insight. <laughs> insight. I mean, all in all, Ibrahim, I think you actually strengthened some of my arguments, or you uh, emphasized some of my arguments. And I agree with many of your observations. I think where we differ is on our understanding of what Hamas uh, grand strategy has been. And uh, I would like to make one point about uh, your observation about the two-state uh, solution, because the two-state uh, possibility, because clearly, I mean, I agree with you that, you know, it's, it, has, it has no viability as a result of Israeli continued occupation, as a result of Israeli uh, settlement growth, growing annexation, and this government is only uh, moving forward even uh, stronger with these uh, policies of uh, gradual uh, ethnic cleansing in uh, the West Bank. And the, the war in Gaza is used by this government, by at least by the settlers, and the settlers who sit in this government, uh, to continue these uh, policies. However, uh, as much as there is no viability for a two-state solution, there is actually, in my view, no other viable option uh, other than that. And the whole talks about, uh, you know, one state federation or the, you know, the multiplicity of possibilities that uh, we are all familiar with, I think are even less viable than considering uh, uh, the possibility of somehow coming with uh, a political solution that involves uh, the creation of a Palestinian state next to Israel. And I'm not suggesting, Annette, by any stretch of the imagination, this is viable right now. 
but I still think that this is the only of all other options. This is the one that uh, we may be still able to consider it uh, constructively. And this is also why I still think that the U.S. has a role to play uh, in this conflict, despite the fact that it has taken, uh, you know, a very clear position in support of uh, Israel in this uh, in this war and also regionally vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah and, uh, and Iran. Because it is still the fact that Israel, that the United States is the only international player that still has leverage, the possibility of leverage against Israel, and it has not used it uh, uh, in the past. But it still could do so, given the gravity of uh, the situation where we are uh, when we are today. Thank you, Asher. Um, there are so many things that uh, will be interesting to pick up on here, but one thing that um, that's come up that I don't think we have responded too much is the issue of Iran within the context of such a regional initiative. And Banafshi, you touched upon that, but in your introductory remarks, you very much emphasized, for lack of a better term, the um, the axis, the alliance between Iran and a number of the non-state actors throughout the region. And of course, that is, as seen from Tihe Tehran's perspective, that is their main regional alliance at the moment. That is an effective alliance, and it's been quite helpful at, um, at protecting Iranian interests. Now, is it imaginable that we could see a path by which a regional initiative would gradually be able to convince Tehran that uh, its main security does not rest on this axis of non-state actors throughout the region, but in fact could rest on a rapprochement with, uh, with its Arab neighbors. Based on pure calculations, the answer is yes, it is imaginable because um, basically any region needs uh, rests on a certain level of uh, distribution of balance of power among multiple actors. In this case, Israel, Iran are main actors. Saudi Arabia is another one. There needs to be a distribution of power. Now, before the Abraham Accords, you know, if, if we look at the history of Israel and Iran, while they've been at each other's throat, they've never really directly attacked each other. And the reason has to do with the need, but the understanding by both of them, that they need to preserve this balance of power to some extent. Because if they don't, and if they get at each other's throats and kill each other, just hypothetically speaking, what does that do? The Arab world rises above them, above two non-Arab states, a Persian night state and a Jewish state. And that would be a more a bigger threat to Israel and, and the Persian, uh, Persianite, you know, empire or state than Israel and, and Iran fighting each other directly, actually. So um, with the Abraham Accords, this, this construct was broken a little bit, meaning that for the first time in history, Israel actually parted uh, with another non-Arab country, i.e. Iran, to forge alliances with Arab countries, something that it hadn't done before. So back to your question, Christian, yes, it is imaginable that if we can create a balance between a, a strong related understanding between the non-Arab countries of the region, Turkey, Israel, and Iran, and between Israel and the Arab countries of the region, then some form of a modus operandi can emerge in which all of the Palestinian issues which Ibrahim referred to, which are heartbreaking, might be addressed. Um, but having said that, and I'm neither, neither a pessimist nor an optimist, I'm just worn out like many other people by the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And so the longer this, this war, this conflict wears everybody out, the less likely it is that we'll achieve that goal. And so this begs the question of where do we stand moving forward, mindful of these kind of iffy scenarios. Uh, and where does the United States stand in all of this? And in my humble view, the United, it's about time that the United States makes a choice of whether it wants to be part of this conflict by fully siding with Israel, which we know very well right now, 
that is highly debatable, even in the US Congress at the moment, it's creating major divides, and it risks another Biden presidency within a year. Um, but, but, but also, if it might just be in the United States longer term interest to engage with multiple fact actors, also sub and non-state actors, terrorist designated actors, we did that with the Houthis for a very long time. We didn't want to do it. And then we did. Why? Because we just figured out there's no other way. So before it's too late, before we hit that roadblock of being too late, will the United States engage with Hamas? Will they sit down at a table and engage with Hezbollah? And believe me, Iran doesn't want that. But imagine if, he, if the United States actually sat down and talked with Hezbollah and with Hamas and then brought Iran in. So I think, yes, it's possible, but there are a lot of um, the wearing out. The Palestinian conflict has worn me out geopolitically. My brain is frozen. And uh, if that happens to every scholar out there, I'm not sure where we stand in a few years. Thank you, Banafsha. I'll limit my comments on that to say that there are no indications as seen from where I sit that your brain is worn out. It's uh, it's working excellently. But Ibrahim has asked for the word and he may have something else to contribute. Thank you. Well, I, again, I think uh, the proposal was made this is really worth uh, discuss, discussing and, you know, contributing with, with this. Uh, because again, we are in, we are desperately looking for any anything that's constructive that could contribute to removing or to ending this disaster. And here again, I would like to just remind ourselves with the conflict resolution literature um, and the foundations of conflict resolutions. What happened to conflicts with severe power imbalances? How do we approach them? How do we deal with them? One thing: What do we do with inclusive? Uh, peace, uh, inclu inclusivity in, in peace building and in, 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 in the approach that we take. Uh, what happened to the absence of a political will in order to engage in, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a conflict resolution process when uh, there is a total absence of a political will uh, in, you know, for, uh, on the side of the power, powerful party? not just an absence of a political will, a, an obvious, very, an, an obvious and serious manipulation of any good conflict resolution initiative like this proposal is to how to manipulate it and serve a settler colonial pro project that, in, that aims to ultimately end the existence of the Palestinians on the 1967 borders. Because that's what the parties who are in power and who have the, the upper hand, that's what they do. And I'm really, really worried that we, we end up violating a major conflict resolution principle, which is do no harm. Because with engaging with good intentions, right, with conflict management initiatives, and that, in, that in, in, involve other regional parties, that you have an extremist fascist government in Tel Aviv that will use this is exactly the way you use the Abraham Accord. I told you so. We can make peace with the region and forget about the Palestinians and about the Palestinian cause and be the subject, the highest, the highest number of, settle, of settlements building, uh, uh, settler terrorism against the civilians in, in Palestine. All happened after the Abraham Accord. This is how it has been used on the ground, is that in extreme escalation of settler violence in the West Bank and building more settlements and bringing uh, Smorich and Bingafir to the government and uh, again paving the way for, for expulsions of the Palestinians. This is, this is what the Abraham Accord has been used for. So uh, on the Israeli government side. So this is when we engage in conflict management Right on this level, given all these indicators, or and giving all these what we're seeing on the ground, I'm really concerned that we could end up facilitating further injustices and further grievances, right, against the weaker party here, is the Palestinians. So we have to be careful of not to give this, right, additional maneuvering cards 
in the hands of Bengafir and Smorich, right, in order to call for openly for genocide and for wiping out an entire population. So that's something we have to be careful about. Again, go back to going back to the conflict resolution literature. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. We are soon going in for a landing, and I have promised Laurie a few minutes at the end to uh, tie up all the loose ends. No, he hasn't promised to do that, but he, he will have a few minutes to uh, to offer a few concluding remarks. But before that, if anybody has one or two quick quick comments to offer, uh, we still have space for that. I mean, I have one comment about the current Israeli government. I mean, I share with Ibrahim his observations about his government. I, uh, I mean, there is no possibility for any, you know, constructive negotiations uh, currently with this uh, government. But you know, my reading of uh, Israeli society right now is that the day after this war is over, there'll be massive, massive uh, protest movement against Netanyahu and against his uh, government. He may survive that uh, protest movement because that's his, you know, that's his art of uh, manipulating Israeli politics to his own benefit and his survival. But there will still be a massive protest movement against this uh, government, and I am hopeful that this government will fall. The question is, what would the next government do, and would the next government uh, seize the moment and uh, understand that? Uh, as I was suggesting, and as Ibrahim himself was also saying, Israel's security uh, the strategy needs to change and understand that Israel's future relies on the future and well-being and the dignity of the Palestinians. So the, the two parties are actually together on the same uh, boat. And uh, I don't know if that will happen, with the next government, I am hopeful, but we are at a crossroads in Israeli history where if there is no drastic change in Israeli policies, we may be just facing to another cycle and another cycle and no end of the violence in, uh, in sight. Mutual assured uh, suffering. This is what uh, we might uh, be heading towards. Thank you, Asher. We'll then hand it uh, back to Laurie to um, to wind up. Thank you very much to um, to the three of you, Laurie. Please. Uh, again, thank you to the panelists. Thank you to Christian. Thank you to Creo. Thank you to my Croc colleagues, who behind the scenes put this together. I want to to begin my closing remarks by affirming Ibrahim's point about do no harm. So conflict management is simply sometimes invoked to keep a lid on the pot, to maintain the status quo. And I don't think that's the idea here at all. I think the status quo is clearly intolerable. I think we agree on that. I think the status quo anti, meaning October 6th, is intolerable. I think we all agree that we have short, medium, and long-term political and humanitarian imperatives that require justice and dignity for all and an end to the occupation and an end to oppression. We, as Croc and Prio, are looking at this crisis primarily through the lens of dialogue, negotiation, and mediation, which is not to say that other lenses are inappropriate. One can look at the conflict from a political, a military, and strategic point of view. Our lens is dialogue, negotiation, mediation. And it is our conviction that however serious a crisis, however serious a conflict, we have faith, if you like, in the ability of dialogue and negotiation and mediation, preventive diplomacy, if done in good faith, to make a meaningful contribution. And this is this is the commitment. I hope that we can continue this dialogue in one way or another, uh, the dialogue around regional options. Um, Ibrahim heads a center in uh, Doha, or is, is, is a senior member of the, the Doha Institute, and we would love to cooperate with you. Um, it's fine we, if we don't agree on all issues, we learn from each other, we learn from disagreement. Um, you're much closer to the action 
uh, than, than I am. And it's through dialogue that we will clarify and crystallize what we think are the best options going forward. I want to end by recognizing at the most fundamental human level, uh, the immense suffering, um, pain, anger, fury, rage, frustration, that is experienced by tens of thousands of people in Palestinian territories, in Israel, in the diasporas, uh, and elsewhere in the world, where people are grieving and furious uh, for deeply personal and political reasons. So there is a human tragedy that is unfolding at the deepest personal level in our homes, in our families, and we wish uh, all of those that are suffering some strength and our commitment, Priya and Croc, with our partners is to continue this dialogue. So thank you for joining us. And we hope in the new year, uh, we are able to pick up on the dialogue and that we are facing a situation that is not quite as bleak and depressing as it is currently. Thank you all.